Institute. Mox is the chair of the Standardization Steering Committee of the ICS, and we're here to find out a little bit more about standardization and an update from this committee. So, Marcus, could you tell us a little bit about the history of standardization at ICS? Well, we first realized many years ago that when a patient came to see a doctor, they would describe some symptoms and the doctor would sort of formulate an opinion on what was going on and come up with a diagnosis. But then when they discussed it with colleagues or other patients came along, there was quite a lot of inconsistency. As a consequence, the ICS recognized that we need to define these terms very clearly so people could understand what we're talking about. Crucial for things like research, where it's essential that you get people with the same condition so that they can have the appropriate treatment and then you can really see if the treatment works. Standardization means that if we describe a term, we know exactly what it is. And if I use that term, it'll mean the same as somebody else using that same term. So we know we're all talking about the same thing. So standardization, in effect, takes all the uh, symptoms, the conditions, and defines them with a group of experts all discussing the best way to define in order to match the patient's conditions. Those terms are then, in effect, standardized, and we expect an individual, when using a word like nocturia, increased daytime frequency, that sort of thing, that when they use it, it's nice, clear, and agreed. So we all know of the 2002 standardization of terminology report, which was a seminal report for ICS and has a huge impact factor. But there was a period of hiatus after that. Could you tell us a little bit about how things have changed with ICS, why we're so active now, and what's changed recently? Well, we've been active all along. These documents have been going back many years. But the 2002 document was so valuable that it really set the benchmark across the field. But it's now 10 years down the line, and we've got uh, new requirements, new needs, and some of the terms have caused some dispute and disagreement. So our aim now is to address any problems that people perceive uh, and also to cross into those other aspects of ICS activity that thus far have had comparatively little attention, such as pelvic organ prolapse, colorectal disease, neurourological activity. So we're now expanding to make these areas comprehensively covered and updating the new stuff so that we have the best for the modern practice. Excellent. And can you tell me a little bit about how you've managed to change your committee to work on so many uh, areas at the same time because we have a huge amount of activity and uh, the size of the committee has obviously stayed the same. The main aim of the current approach is that standardization is now a steering committee and what we do is we identify experts in particular fields who have to apply for a working group and it's the working groups that develop the documents. That way we can ensure experts in the field genuinely are contributing that it's a good, balanced group, and also to make sure that we're compliant with modern-day governance. In other words, that there's no conflict of interest, that the standardization steering committee members aren't just taking the best posts for themselves in order to get named on high-impact publications. Now, nowadays, it's all to ensure that governance is appropriate and the best interests of the patients and the professions are delivered, not the individuals taking on the reports themselves. Great. And uh, the reports themselves obviously involve a, a huge uh, number of people in the consultation phase as well. Could you tell us a little bit about how a standardization report uh, is developed from its first draft through to final publication and how uh, professionals get involved in that process? Sure. Well, last year we published a paper that set this out nicely. The starting point is we identify an area of need and put out a call for people to apply to belong to the working group. We then go through the appointment of the chairman and then the membership. The members then work together, guided by the chairman, in order to produce a draft report going through various development stages until it reaches a final report. That goes off to the Standardization Steering Committee for review, and if it's to a suitable level or minor amendments are needed, it will then get those minor amendments and be recommended to the trustees before publication. And I'm aware of being the IT director that uh, you do a lot of this consultation online and uh, could you tell us a little bit more about the other online tools that are being generated and developed by your committee? 
Well, our first uh, most valuable tool is, of course, the ICS Office Forum. We set up individual forums for the relevant uh, working groups, the point being that we can then ensure that it's documented and clearly accessible to all people that can log on to the ICS website, showing that each committee member genuinely makes a contribution. Our other useful approach now is the wiki, the ICS wiki. My concern has long been that if we rely on PubMed and various papers published sporadically over time, people have got to search for them, know which one to get, and has actively got to go and download that document. And it's a bit of a nuisance. Thanks to the wiki, all this information is in one location. And whatever term you need to find out about, whatever condition, go to wiki and you will get that information. Excellent. One of the main things that uh, the ICS is interested in is promoting education for our younger members. Can you tell us how standardisation uh, applies to people who are at the start of their careers? Well, it's a professional standard that if you are coming into a specialist field, you have to know the terminology appropriately. So as a very starting point, you need to have the basic information the key terms. Now that's one of the initiatives that we're about to start is a core terminology document, the most fundamental symptoms, conditions, their definitions. And we're setting up a teaching module with a small paper and a self-test module associated so people can demonstrate knowledge of core terminology. Subsequently, as your confidence and knowledge increases, you'd be encouraged to participate in developing aspects, for example, pages on the wiki. You could take one of those on, get responsibility, and under the tutelage of the editor of the wiki and the associate editors, you can take that on yourself, develop it, and demonstrate your ability to assimilate and drive on the educational aspect. Excellent. And if somebody was particularly interested in a certain area and they were working in that area and felt that they were an expert, how would they start to get involved with ICS in a working group on a new standardization report? Well, a new standardization report, an advert goes out, and if you want to apply to belong to the working group developing the document, you need to respond to that advert. But if you have an interest in another aspect or wish to um, make new elements that will highlight key issues, then you can very more than welcome to approach us and discuss it either through the ICS office or direct to the standardization steering committee members. We're all very approachable and very keen to get as much input as we can. We need more help. It's a big area. Fabulous. Um, could you also tell us a little bit about the uh, recent meeting that we had in Beijing? You were uh, on the panel of the most important section that we had in the state of the art program, the OAB debate. It had a huge impact factor after the meeting. It was very popular with all of our delegates and with their people watching the webcasts on the ICS website. And it's obviously a, a key area of interest. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the debate that we had on OAB and uh, where OAB is going because it features in the program for Barcelona? Well, perfect. That was the Norman Zinner debate in, in memory of Dr. Zinner, who is one of the greats of the area. And some key individuals covered some of the most fundamental aspects. Uh, for example, the terminology was discussed, issues, treatments, the relevance of the brain, the relevance of the periphery, all comprehensively discussed. And it was a most um, rewarding session to participate in, and I think a, a great tribute to Dr. Zinner. So as we move on, overactive bladder, there are concerns that people express quite regularly that this, as defined, is not as good as it needs to be to match the clinical situation that people have if they attend with symptoms. So our next approach is to ensure that um, overactive bladder, the terminology is clarified, that we will issue clarification notes in effect in response to a survey which we're going to issue so that people can comment on what they feel about OAB as a term, urgency, frequency, increased daytime frequency in particular, nocturia. These aspects have some controversies and we will survey everybody in order to make it as clear as possible to get this as good as we can for the future. Thank you very much, Marcus. And uh, I'd like to thank Marcus for appearing on ICS TV today.